Please join me in a prayer for the reading of scripture. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and redeemer. May our eyes be opened and our hearts enlivened by your word for your people today. In Christ's name we pray, amen. So our scripture for today comes from the book of Acts, the very beginning, chapter one, verses one through eight. So here with the spirit is still saying to the church. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up into heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them for 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and all Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So sometimes it can be hard to wait, can't it? I'm not talking about waiting in line at the supermarket when you can see the cash register ahead and know that it will just be minutes until you can get there, but it taking, seems to take forever because you're a little annoyed. Not that kind of waiting. I'm not even talking about the exciting day long waiting, the day before Christmas, the day before the first day of school, or the day before you start a new job. I'm talking about the long form of expectant waiting, when you are not sure that it is going to actually end. But you can't wait for the life after the waiting is over. I'm not even talking about waiting like an expectant pregnant mother. Now she knows she's got nine months. I'm talking about the waiting and you're not sure when it will end. The kind of waiting of an eager fiance for their deployed service person to come home. I'm talking about the eager parent who is just waiting for the adoption to complete. I'm talking about the eager person sitting at home for 15 months waiting for the pandemic to end. Yeah. I mean, I'm talking about can't just stand waiting any longer to hug and sing and talk close to strangers, to eat out and laugh loudly and be carefree, to stop having to feel like you're judging others or being judged because you are ready for that freedom and that joy and that power to return to your life. You want the after to be now but you are told to wait, not yet, keep waiting. And I think that's a little bit like what the disciples in Jerusalem are feeling. They're excited, oh, but they're waiting. I mean, they have already been through the worst and now they have seen the miracle that Jesus is alive and they believe it. And now they have this amazing story to tell but Jesus tells them to wait in Jerusalem, to not leave, stay here. Wait for the promise of what you have not yet received. For not many days from now, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And the disciples believe him. So they ask, 
will when this kingdom be restored to Israel? Is it now? Is it now that the kingdom will be restored to Israel? And Jesus doesn't say yes or no. This is not the usual problem that we find in the Gospels of the disciples not understanding what Jesus is talking about. No, Jesus has already opened their minds to the scriptures. They have begun to understand. So they get it that Jesus is the Messiah and his job is the restoration of God's world. What they don't understand is just how big that world is. So when they ask the question, is it time to restore the kingdom to Israel? They mean themselves and they need to think bigger. So why are they waiting then? Well, one reason they might be waiting is that they need to keep listening to Jesus. They need to keep learning from him. They need to catch sight of the vision that this new community is way bigger than the people in Jerusalem, way bigger than faithful Jewish folk. It's big. But they might also need to be waiting because now is the time to start building the foundation of that new community. The disciples gathered together in the upper room now have this time to tell their stories to each other to listen to Jesus, to grow in confidence and in faith, to deepen what they know so that they'll be ready for all that's going to be coming their way when this new gift arrives. Because 40 days later, they may not know it yet, but 40 days later is the Feast of Pentecost, Shavuot in the Jewish faith. And it's the celebration of the giving of the Torah, the first five books of the Pentateuch, Moses on the mountain, and all that came out of that, all the faith that they had in the giving of the five books. That is what's going to bring all of these faithful Jewish people from all over the world, the diaspora. They're coming from the Mediterranean and from Greece and from Rome back for this feast. And they don't know it yet, but that's when their world is going to explode. It will be a very convenient time to tell the story of what's just happened in a few weeks. It's as if God has a plan. So instead of telling them yes or no, Jesus tells them what will happen. You will be baptized by the Holy Spirit. You will receive that power and you will be my witnesses here and everywhere. And you might remember that last week we talked about how in a way you are already witnesses of these things. You have already seen God at work in your life. And you can tell the story of what has happened in the past with an eye to where God was involved. But now we get to talk about what we are going to witness. Now we get to talk about what God is going to do. It's the anticipation that God already has a plan laid out. That we might get let in on the good trouble God's got going. That you are going to see some amazing things through this gift of the Holy Spirit. That is the story of the book of Acts. It's an incredible book and it's a really important one. And it's one that Christians often don't really spend a lot of time in. It's not a gospel just talking about the life of Jesus. And it's not a letter and it's kind of long. And it's a little bit complicated. If you have lived your life in the Protestant faith or with the reformed common lectionary, we don't often talk about the book of Acts, but it's what the foundation of the church was made in. And it's really fun that the book of Acts is written by the exact same author as the Gospel of Luke. We know that. But it's not a gospel because it just doesn't talk about the good news of who Jesus is, was, and will be. No, Acts talks about the struggle of a new community of Christ followers. And that's what makes the story a little hard to pin down. Because what's happening in it? 
It opens a bit like a letter, my dear Theophilus. But even then, who is Theophilus? The name means lover of God. So while the author could be writing to a patron or a friend, he could also be writing to all of the readers who will pick up these pages. And it's not really a letter. Outside of the introduction, it becomes more of a story. It has a narrative. And its traditional name is Acts of the Apostles. But the only character that we follow, the only apostle throughout the entire thing, is actually the Holy Spirit working in and through the apostles and disciples. Or you could think of the character that's being developed in the early church. But even then, this story is not just a narrative. It doesn't just tell us what happens, nor is it a history of what happened in things appearing to occur in actual places and at actual times. Because the author uses his incredible gift for writing to paint more, to layer on meaning to the narrative of what happens, to give an explanation, a theology, a story, a witness of what God is doing. The book of Acts is itself witnessing. It is a confession about what God is doing in the world after Jesus' ascension, after the coming of the Holy Spirit. You might even begin to think of Acts as the start and continuation of our story. And this one last challenge, this last question people must have had, the question people must still have today, is how do they belong to this new community? They believe, and so they will be given the power of the Holy Spirit, and they will be joined to a community. You can't be a full Christian alone. And that's a hard message when we are separated. And so many of us are experiencing this from behind a screen. And so how do we develop real, tangible, meaningful community? That is the crisis of faith that the Holy Spirit comes to address now. That is why we are going to marinate in the book of Acts for an entire season as a church. The season of summer will be spent in the book of Acts because we are at a place now in the life of the church, the global church, where we need to know more about what it is to follow and be empowered by the Holy Spirit and what it means for that spirit to build or rebuild a community. A community that is led not by our desires. A spiritual community that is not led by one minister. A spiritual community that is led by God's Holy Spirit and God's will. It's how we discern the will of the Holy Spirit in this time for this place and this people. Because we've changed. We didn't want it. We didn't ask for it. But it's happened and God meets us here exactly as we are. The big question that people keep voicing sounds like, when are we getting back to normal? And everybody means something different by that. Some people mean, when can we sing? Other people mean, when can we hug and not get a dirty look from the pastor? Many of us mean, when can we take off our masks? And many of us also mean, in our heart of hearts, when will everyone return? When will we feel like we've been brought back together again? When will a sense of normalcy return? But I don't think that's the question the Holy Spirit is asking. I'm afraid that the Holy Spirit seems to be asking a very different kind of question. The Holy Spirit seems to be asking, 
When will we start telling this story in all the new ways it needs to be told? When will we start telling this amazing story in the way that people need to hear it today? Because people are living in and beginning to emerge from the pandemic, this year of separation and grief, and our patterns and our habits have changed. We look totally different. So how do people need to hear this story now? Our pews and our building might be sufficient for some, but not for everyone. So how do we tell the story now? And do we believe that the Holy Spirit will empower us to do so? Here's a really interesting piece of news. According to the Pew Research Center, which studies church trends in America and globally, in the United States, 28% of Americans say that their faith has become stronger in the pandemic. And 68% say that their faith hasn't changed. Huh. Now that's of current believing Christians. It's not the widening gap of those who have no faith, the nuns and duns, and those who may have lost their faith before. And in our own congregation, this is really interesting, about 150 people-ish, give or take, we have consistently had 45 in worship on the Sundays where we've met in person. There were 80 in worship over Easter weekend. That was very encouraging. But we also have a very consistent group of people participating online. And that means that we've got a third of us presently meeting here and two thirds of us who are not yet ready or able to return to this form of worship. And yet, many are still engaged. People might not be ready to come back to the building, but that's okay because the building is not the church. But I also know, as a parent and a pastor, that the majority of our children are not participating in worship in the building or online. Some are, don't get me wrong. But it's become abundantly clear that we must rethink how we are engaging and encouraging our kids. Our children are not our future, they're our present, they're the now. And we know without a shadow of a doubt that the pandemic has been particularly hard on kids and adolescents. And they need connection with their faith now more than ever. They need mentors and church grandparents. They need to know they are loved and accepted. And they need examples about how faith has pulled them through. And we can be a part of that. We will be a part of that. But it's not going to look like it did when parents and grandparents, aunts and uncles were growing up. It won't even look like it did two Christmases ago. It will be that we are challenged to build relationships and invest time in our young people in some different ways. I also happen to know from looking a little bit at our analytics from YouTube that there are a number of our midlife adults that are getting a lot out of engaging worship online, sometimes multiple times. Some folks join us at 11 a.m. Sunday mornings and watch the entire service online. But some folks tune in at a different time. It might be when they've created space in their lives when they can study or be quiet, when they have time for peace and reflection, or they might be making the opportunity to take something dull and make it holy, like a commute or washing the dishes. Our YouTube metrics show that some people doing that will watch the whole thing, but there's a not small number of people who just skip to the sermon and maybe a song and the prayers. And it's a really good clue that that might be a way some folks want to engage 
Some folks want to engage with scripture and community in a different format than we've used before. Our online worship has enabled us to engage with people who've never been inside this building. We got a phone call just a few weeks ago from a woman who lives in Levy. She is a retired medical technician, and maybe she'll see this online, who told us that she enjoys the music we sing, even as it is our virtual choir. That's something we should celebrate. An aspect of our ministry is reaching people we haven't even met yet. And while she's welcome to walk through those doors, she might not have to, to be welcomed in. It certainly looks and feels like the Holy Spirit really is moving. The Holy Spirit is already empowering believers and inducting people into a new community of faith. It just doesn't look like the one we recognize from our childhood. It's not bound by walls or time. And yet, it is generous, welcoming, open, brave, and very much alive. And so who are we becoming? I think we can find out more by following the example set for us in the book of Acts. And so welcome to this season of witnessing, this season of confession, this new season through the summer, witnessing the Acts of the Holy Spirit in the book Acts of the Apostles, in confessing what we believe, in admitting what we hope to see in the movement of the Holy Spirit, just like the early spirit, early church was led by the Spirit into the wildness of a new world of possibility, so are we. We might need to wait uh, just a little bit longer, but we can use this time. We can use this time to learn and deepen our own personal faith. We can use this time to recommit ourselves to whatever this community is growing into. We can use this time to love and prepare because, y'all, the Holy Spirit is coming for us. You will be witnesses of these things. I can promise that because I have already seen how the Holy Spirit is at work now in our community, building us up, teaching us to spread our wings, encouraging us to try new things and not be afraid of failure, admitting that we miss what we once had and we know we can have pieces of it again but they'll be a little bit different. You will be witnesses of these things. And y'all, I can't wait. May the Lord bless you and keep you this week. May you be blessed in your merciful acts of kindness out in the world in the name of Jesus. May you deepen your faith. May you admit your needs and reach out your hands for help. May this community be empowered by the Holy Spirit again and again and again. And may those fresh winds of energy and hope reach you wherever you are. Amen.